Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the next in the series of uh, Downtown Law and Business webinars for the Ross Parsons Centre for Commercial Corporate and Taxation Law here at Sydney Law School. Uh, my name is Jason Harris. I'm Professor of Corporate Law here at the Law School, and I'm also the Ross Parsons Centre Director. Um, this series of webinars was uh, started during the pandemic, and, and the goal really is to reach out to the legal profession and the business profession and share some of the excellent research that some of our staff are doing here at the law school, and also from time to time we have people outside the law school presenting. Our topic for tonight is insolvency and tax debts, the special position of the ATO, and this is an incredibly uh, topical uh, subject. Uh, many on the line would be aware that the Parliamentary Joint Committee, which is a, a federal parliament uh, committee, has been looking at insolvency law over the last year. And uh, last month, they actually handed down their final report. And there's a, a whole section of that report which talks about the role of the ATO. There were many submissions uh, that were talking about the important position of the ATO during insolvency processes. Uh, and it remains to be seen whether some of the recommendations uh, for the conduct of the ATO going forward will be actioned. But I'm delighted to introduce our presenters tonight to uh, help us weave through the special position of the ATO in insolvency with tax debts. Our first presenter tonight is Lindsay Powers. Lindsay is an adjunct associate professor of law here at Sydney Law School, where he teaches insolvency law. He's previously taught at the University of New South Wales and also at UTS. And he was a partner with Minter Ellison, practicing in insolvency law for 28 years. He's now a senior legal consultant with that firm. Lindsay also writes for the Journal of Banking and Finance Law and Practice, and he is an editor of that journal's insolvency section. Our second presenter tonight is Michael Hughes. Michael is a partner at Minter Ellison, where he has specialised in insolvency and restructuring for over 30 years. He's a fellow of the Australian Restructuring, Insolvency and Turnaround Association and is a recipient of the President's Prize for Excellence. So thanks very much, Lindsay and Michael. Just by way of housekeeping for our uh, audience this evening, uh, our speakers are happy to take questions. Um, if you wouldn't mind putting your question in the Q&A uh, uh, toolbar, a little button that you should see down there at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. I'll monitor the questions as we're going through. And then when we get to the end of each presenter's uh, presentation, then I'll, I'll go through the questions that have been posted up. Over to you, Lindsay. Thank you, Jason. I'll just share my screen. All right, um, thanks very much. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, your interest in this session tonight. Um, as an outline of what we're going to do, um, uh, basically uh, five uh, sections for my presentation. I'm going to do a very, very brief uh, uh, history lesson in relation to the former position uh, of the Crown in insolvencies. And when I talk about the Crown, I'm obviously, for tonight's purposes, talking about the Crown as represented by the Australian Government Tax Office. And we'll see that although that um, uh, traditional position has uh, been legislated away, uh, in return, uh, there were some special privileges uh, given to the Commissioner, and uh, we will then proceed to look at those, which are, uh, firstly, the ability to transfer tax liability direct to directors via the director penalty notice regime. We'll look at another way in which tax liability of a company can be transmitted to the directors personally, uh, in the context of their uh, require the requirement for them to indemnify uh, the tax commissioner when the tax commissioner uh, is required to disgorge uh, receipts from the taxpayer. Then we'll look at statutory demands uh, as used by the commissioner to recover tax, and we'll see that uh, the commissioner is in a particularly privileged position when issuing statutory demands, uh, in terms of the ability to engage in setting aside applications and the like. And finally, I'm going to then touch on the um, statutory garnishee powers that the Australian Taxation Office can wield, uh, the ability to intercept uh, monies that are otherwise due to a taxpayer uh, from their uh, debtors uh, and to apply that towards tax liability. This is going to be very short and sweet. Um, it's a much longer and deeper history uh, than I'll be presenting tonight. Uh, 
And there are a number of very good articles you'll find uh, on the internet uh, which uh, uh, reminisce over the former position. Uh, I want to just basically do enough to explain to you how we got where we are today. And there's a critical time when all things started to change in relation to Crown priority and the Tax Commissioner's priority, and that was in 1980. Before 1980, in both bankruptcies and liquidations, um, the liability to pay tax was treated as a Crown debt, and it was entitled to priority payment before all other creditors of equal uh, standing. And the priority was given regardless of the nature of the taxation obligation. Uh, it included priority in respect of unpaid income tax, at least for a period uh, uh, leading up to uh, for 12 months uh, uh, in arrears, and also to tax liabilities for what are called remittance obligations, which we'll be looking at in more detail in a little while. Uh, many of you will be familiar with these sorts of obligations. They don't represent tax that's actually levied on the taxpayer, uh, they represent amounts which the law requires um, uh, an employer, for example, to deduct from the wages of employees and then remit on to the commissioner uh, for the purposes of uh, pay-as-you-go income tax. And uh, in some cases, with these uh, priorities that is, as they existed historically, they even had priority over secured creditors. Former Section 221P of the Income Tax Assessment Act 1936. Uh, for those of you who are old and uh, uh, wise, I hope, uh, will remember the amount of litigation that, that that particular section generated in the context of secured creditors seeking to enforce their security by appointing receivers and the like without uh, having to suffer the fate of having uh, the commissioner step in uh, to have a bite at their security. Sorry, Lindsay, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. We're, yep. we're actually still looking just at your first slide. Oh, they're not, aren't they clicking over? No. Okay, um, let me just see what's it's happening. It's also not in presenter mode. Okay, um, let's so, see. Yeah, we're looking at a, a keynote just of the first slide. Okay, well, let's just stop the share and I will... Um, Oh, there we go. Now, now, now I can see a change. Okay. Um, but you're not getting that. Uh huh. So, Let's so just... we can see the rationale slide, but we're seeing okay. it in the kind of edit mode. Okay. All right. Well, look. Um, uh, let Let me just trust try one thing. Uh, sure. which I, I'll just stop that share. Start sharing again. Don't know why it's changed because we did, of course, test yeah. this out about half That's an hour. That's right. <laughs> How's is that? Is that showing up as uh, uh, rationale? Yes, we we can see the slide. It's still kind of in edit mode where we can see slide okay. layout, title, and subtitle, but we can right see right. the standard slide. Right here. Rather than delay everybody, let's just use it uh, in the form of edit mode, and sure. uh, I'll take the slides as they as they come. Okay, so um, uh, we were talking about now the rationale. So we've talked about the, the pre-existing uh, Crown priority. Why did the Crown deserve priority? Essentially, the um, uh, main reason was that, uh, so it was said, uh, the Crown is an involuntary creditor. The tax commissioner is obliged to collect tax. Um, there is no choice about it. If the legislation imposes uh, an impost on uh, citizens, then the Crown is the person that the payments should be made to, uh, and there's no choice about it at all. And of course, the reason why there is uh, a need uh, to recognise that is that the government revenue is in fact protected uh, by uh, these measures, which would otherwise leave the, um, the position of the Crown and its instrumentalities uh, on an equal footing with other creditors. So we, we something needs to be done to recognise the special position of the Crown. And in some ways, um, it is said that the, um, the debts that are payable in relation to tax liabilities in particular, they are really debts due to the community because the money is not going into some obscure uh, uh, destination. It's going into government revenue. 
and governments can't function without receiving revenue and tax revenue is of course a very large part of it so that's another reason why it was thought that this should be treated as uh, a priority amount now things started to change politically uh, in the late 70s and in the 1978 Misson report by Senator Misson uh, there was a recommendation made that there should be complete abolition of all crown priority in the administration of insolvent estates. However, that was not acted on immediately. Two principal acts came into effect subsequent to that in 1980 and 1981. And then the sum, uh, sum total of the effect of that was that all priority for direct taxes, for example, income tax, uh, was abolished. And the 1981 Act also made it clear that uh, the Crown was not to be treated as having any special status when, for example, in a liquidation, to, it became uh, necessary to commence proceedings to recover a preference. The 1981 Acts made it clear that the Crown was bound, just like any other uh, 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 person, to recognise the, uh, the provisions of the relevant uh, uh, corporations' uh, laws. However, the priority for these unremitted amounts continued. Group tax, that was section 221P. Withholding tax, again, another form of tax, which is not a tax levied on the um, person who's under the obligation. Rather, it's a collection of tax for the benefit of the government in respect of, for example, uh, organisations that are residing overseas. Uh, natural resources tax and royalty deductions and also prescribed payment deductions. Now, all of these sections have now been abolished, uh, as we'll see in a moment, but they were preserved despite these uh, amending acts. They were These liabilities and these priorities were preserved, um, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it had been recommended that all uh, the liabilities should be, uh, all of the taxation liabilities um, should be reduced to non-priority debts. In 1998, we had the very important Harmer Report, which is the Commission Law Reform Commission, Commonwealth Law Reform Commission's General Insolvency Inquiry Report. And in relation to Crown Priority, they made a very clear recommendation that any remaining Crown Priority, and that was, of course, for these remittance obligations, uh, should be abolished in the administration of insolvent estates. And I emphasise we're, we're talking not only about uh, corporate taxpayers here, but we're also talking about individuals and bankruptcies. And one of the uh, the uh, points that were uh, that, that, that was made by the Harmer report about the uh, need to have this general abolition was that why while you preserve these remittance obligations and give them priority, it disincentivizes the ATO to do anything by way of recovery because when the music stops, if the debts continue accrue and there is a priority, then that is going to be uh, recognized. Uh, uh, despite the fact that action may have been able to be taken much earlier and the amounts that have accrued may have been less. So there was unfairness seen there uh, in relation to preserving these priorities. Um, so that's what happened in 1993 when we had the uh, uh, Law Reform Commission uh, report uh, uh, enacted in the uh, Corporate Law Reform Act. Um, and there was uh, 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 legislation that was introduced at the same time uh, with to give effect with respect to these uh, uh, abolition of tax priorities. All of these unremitted amounts that had previously enjoyed uh, this transitional priority, they lost that priority uh, completely. But there was a trade-off. Uh, as part of the package of amendments, there, were some, there was the introduction of some of the provisions that we're going to look at tonight. Uh, importantly, the ATO was uh, entitled to now issue uh, binding notices of assessment of liability in respect of these unremitted amounts without the need for any formal notice of assessment. And that was in, uh, in the Taxation Administration Act in Schedule 1. Um, and I think the principal driving uh, factor there was that um, it's sometimes very difficult, notwithstanding the Commissioner's uh, broad powers to obtain information and to investigate the affairs uh, of a taxpayer, 
it was still nevertheless difficult to gather enough information, certainly in a prompt period of time, to levy a formal notice of assessment. So it was possible for the liability to be crystallised simply by the commissioner making a reasonable estimate of the liability for these unremitted amounts. And there was the introduction of these uh, transmission sections which transmit or permit transmitting uh, liability for unremitted amounts to be uh, uh, focused on the directors of the company. In effect, directors acting as a guarantor of the company uh, in respect of these uh, unremitted amounts. Uh, director penalty notices were, was the mechanism that was introduced. And um, there was also uh, introduced, and we'll look at this in a moment, the liability to indemnify the ATO, the director's liability to indemnify the ATO, if the ATO has been held to have received a preference. Now, a word about navigating the tax legislation, because we're going to dive into it a little bit further. Uh, and it can be very confusing if you come to this uh, uh, for the first time or you're not regularly traversing it. Um, tax practitioners will be well aware of the complexity of all of this. But let me simplify it by explaining just four points about the tax legislation that's relevant for tonight. The Principal Taxing Act in relation to income tax is an, and always was the Income Tax Assessment Act of 1936 and its predecessors. In 1997, there was a new Income Tax Assessment Act uh, passed through the Parliament. Um, and it was not a com comprehensive uh, uh, rewriting of the old Act. In fact, it was part of a project called the <clears throat> Taxation Law Simplification Project, where they were rewriting, or, the, or at least the intention was to rewrite, hopefully in plain language, some of the more labyrinthine provisions uh, in the existing tax legislation. And it didn't get very far. There were three divisions that were converted into plain language, uh, and they found their way into this 1997 Act. But unfortunately, as far as I can tell, the process has stopped. The, um, the uh, result of that is that we have two taxing acts in relation, certainly in relation to income tax, uh, which operate in parallel. Um, it was the ambition to transfer everything into the 1997 Act, but that hasn't happened. Now, in addition to all of that, there was the Taxation Administration Act of 1953. And this was drafted originally to contain the principal provisions, not in connection with determining taxation and rates of taxation and the like, but in relation to the steps and the powers of the commissioner in relation to recover recovery of unpaid amounts. Until 1999, um, there were uh, not only, there was not only the Taxation Administration Act, but collection and recovery actually found its way across 10 different acts. And uh, that included, for example, one, once it was introduced, the GST. What happened in 1999 was that it was decided to consolidate all of the recovery processes by transferring them into the Taxation Administration Act. But they didn't do it in the usual way. They did it in a way which I think is now becoming uh, uh, not uncommon with legislative drafting, and that is by putting provisions, operative provisions, into a schedule to that Act of 1953. And so we're now looking at Schedule 1 of the Taxation Administration Act uh, as the source of much of what we're going to be talking about tonight. So you go to the Act, but you flip straight through to Schedule 1, and it's going to show you where these provisions are now consolidated. They did... Uh, in the course of doing this, um, try to follow the style of the 1997 simplified legislation. So we had the combination of division and section numbers. So section five of division 260 is now referred to as 260-5. And there were some other communication uh, 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 mechanics also employed with text boxes, explanatory introductions and the like. And I guess why we find this all in the schedule rather than being drafted into the Tax Administration Act is because of the different styles and the need to recognise that the old Act followed the typical taxation rule of just adding letters after the numbers of sections uh, almost ad infinitum. So the 1999 amendments introducing Schedule 1 
introduced these provisions. They are substantive provisions, uh, but they are in a different style to what's found um, earlier in the legislation. That's all I want to say uh, uh, about the uh, complex web of tax legislation. If you can get a handle on these particular acts, um, then you will probably have enough to know uh, about uh, the position of tax in insolvency without looking at um, anything further. Right, let's look at these provisions which uh, uh, give the Commissioner uh, special powers. Firstly, direct a penalty notices. And again, th this, these are now consolidated in Schedule 1 of the 1953 Act, and we're looking at Subdivision 269. What the legislation applies to is amounts that are owing or estimated under remittance provisions. So PAYG provisions in relation to payment of employees, withholding taxes, GST. If the company fails to pay the amounts on their due date, but has reported the fact that they haven't paid, for example, in the form of a BAS for GST, and that happens within three months of the due date, then the position for the directors is gives them a little bit of, uh, it gives them options. Um, first of all, a notice is served on the directors that a penalty has been imposed uh, for which they will be liable equal to these amounts that have been determined to be due. That penalty can be waived if within 21 days the amount due is actually paid, so you, you actually cough up the amount in full, or if the directors cause the company to go into an insolvency administration being uh, small business restructuring, voluntary administration, or liquidation. And the idea here, obviously, is to incentivize the directors to either pay or to stop trading and hand the business over to uh, an independent practitioner. There are not many options there, but there is at least the option of putting something uh, uh, in place whereby the directors, uh, if they haven't got the money, can at least avoid this personal liability. Now, there are more significant consequences where there's been no reporting of the outstanding amounts within that three-month period. The penalty notice that's issued is referred to as a lockdown penalty notice, and the only way to get a remission of the penalty is to have the amount outstanding paid within 21 days. There is no, opp no opportunity to relate. You might very well put the company into administration or liquidation or, or um, uh, restructuring, but it doesn't absolve you from the potential liability that you now have for the company's uh, obligations. And uh, if the penalty is not remitted, you don't do anything, then the full panoply of recovery uh, action is available uh, to the commissioner uh, uh, against the director uh, as a personal defendant. There are defences that are um, uh, set out uh, which uh, can give a director uh, a defence when sued for uh, uh, a penalty uh, imposed under a DPN. Um, for example, the, the director was not taking part in the management of the, of the business because of illness or other good reason at the time the obligations were incurred, or that all reasonable steps were taken to comply with the obligation. For those of you who are familiar with insolvent trading legislation and uh, the liability of the potential liability of directors, the defences are very much uh, modelled on that. Uh, and you'll also know, if you're familiar with it, that the ability to avail yourself of these defences uh, is quite limited. Um, let me move on now to the other means by which liability for tax uh, is transmitted to directors, and that's under Section 588 FGA in connection with voidable transactions. Why? Why is this done? This was Justice Campbell in Sims uh, in uh, 2006 explaining that the commissioner was, uh, in terms of uh, being a creditor uh, and uh, having received payments during relevant clawback periods that could be challenged as preferences, uh, the commission is at a disadvantage because the commissioner will generally have a pretty detailed knowledge or ability to acquire information about the company's financial health, uh, unlike any other uh, creditor. Um, and being that would therefore inhibit the ability of the commissioner uh, to make out a defence 
of being a bona fide recipient, uh, which was in fact preferential. And Justice Campbell said that this should be made up for by giving the commissioner different rights altogether, namely a right to be indemnified by a director. Now, notwithstanding that, um, those of you who read the preference cases will see that the commissioner is often sued and uh, has often uh, sought to uh, uh, rely on the uh, defence of being a recipient in good faith without suspicion of insolvency. So uh, it doesn't certainly doesn't uh, mean that the commissioner is automatically going to uh, throw in the towel, um, but it does in fact provide uh, a means, a fallback position for the commissioner um, where uh, uh, a, a liquidator is successful in pursuing the action. Uh, the ingredients of it, it applies if a court makes an order against the commissioner on the basis of the payment of these particular taxes, which are the remittance amounts. It also includes, in this case, superannuation um, guarantee amounts. Um, if they are ordered to be repaid under Section 588 FF, for example, if the payment was a, an unfair preference. Uh, to make out uh, the claim against the directors, the person needs to be in a director when the payment was actually made by the ATO to the commissioner. Uh, the court has to make an order uh, against the commissioner. Now, that can include orders that are made by consent. If the commissioner is not bound to defend the proceedings, if the commissioner believes that there is no reasonable basis on which to do so, and particularly where if there's some prospect that the directors are going to be able to indemnify the commissioner. So consent orders can be made, but the case law suggests that uh, that can only be effective against the directors if they are adjoined uh, in the proceedings that are brought against the commissioner uh, as third parties, which is sometimes the case. Or if the commissioner has elected not to join them and, and, rely, and, and is prepared to pursue them uh, after the outcome of the case against the commissioner is known, um, if they have, have been joined, that's fine. If they're not, the cases are saying that before a consent order is going to be made, the director should be notified and allowed the opportunity to be heard. The consequences of the order... Um, the person, the director, must indemnify the commissioner in respect of what's referred to loss or damage. Uh, and the case law, again, makes it clear that that includes not only just dis the amount disgorged, but also includes the commissioner's costs and also interest. The only consolation that directors have is that they have a right of subrogation as if they had been an actual guarantor of the company's liabilities to the commissioner. Um, and that's found in Section 588 FGA. Whether that is going to be of any use to them at all will probably be academic in many cases because they'll simply be lodging uh, a proof of debt, just like any other guarantor who's coughed up in response to the liability of the guaranteed uh, debtor. Uh, if the company is insolvent and there's going to be no um, prospect of a dividend, well, then it's cold comfort. Once again, statutory defences for directors who want to resist the obligation to indemnify. And uh, again, you'll see them in 588 FGB, quite similar to the insolvent trading defences, such as justifiable non-participation in management. In fact, when uh, I'm teaching insolvent trading uh, to students, one of the principal cases when we look at the defences to, to insolvent trading is a case of Deputy Commissioner of Taxation versus Clark. And that was, in fact, an, a 588 FGA case uh, but it explained what was meant uh, in this similarly worded provision uh, dealing with um, justifiable non-participation in management. And that was a case where uh, Mrs. Clark was uh, uh, simply a housewife who'd been asked to become a director of the company, played no role in the management at all, uh, found herself uh, on the end of a claim by the commissioner under this section and was unable to make out uh, a, a defence because simply not involving yourself in the affairs of the company is not justifiable non-participation in management. Let me turn now quickly to statutory demands uh, for tax debts. Um, just a refresher for those of you who uh, are not as familiar as others with this particular device, but it's a method provided for by the Corporations Act, 
to enable a creditor to demonstrate a company is insolvent and thereby uh, ask the court on that evidence to make an order that the company be wound up. The prerequisite is that the amount that's owed to the creditor needs to be a minimum of $4,000 from 1 July 2021. It was $2,000 before that. The creditor is entitled to serve a written notice. It's in a prescribed form, prescribed under the Corporations Act. And in essence, it just requires the company to either pay the amount that is claimed by the creditor or to make an acceptable arrangement to pay within a very limited period of time, 21 days after service of the notice. If you failed, fail to comply, if you fail to do one of those two things, then that can be treated as evidence of your insolvency and enable winding up application to be made. Uh, people often browse, uh, uh, browse over this section, but 459E subsection 5 uh, is a special uh, reference to the position of tax debts, which uh, makes it clear that they are equally capable of being the subject of a statutory demand. Normally, for those of you who are uh, practitioners in this area, normally you will see a recipient of a statutory demand uh, seeking to avoid uh, the presumption of insolvency by applying, as they are entitled to under the Corporations Act, to set the statutory demand aside, uh, aside. That has to be done within the 21 days. But if you apply and you are successful, then effectively this time bomb that you've been handed uh, ceases to tick. Um, that's if you can establish a genuine dispute that the debt is owed to the creditor. Statutory demands do not require you to have first obtained a judgment against the debtor. Uh, they can be served even without a judgment, so long as there's a verifying affidavit whereby the creditor swears to the fact that the debt is due. And so there's always potential for these things to flush out a dispute uh, at this stage, whereas if proceedings had been taken, in the first instance, then uh, a defence might have been raised and thrashed out in court. So that's the ne that's the necessary trade-off for uh, these notices and their, their very uh, powerful effects. Give the debtor the opportunity to defuse the situation by raising a genuine dispute. And the news for tonight is that is not the case where the ATO is the creditor. Where do we, how do we get to that conclusion? Well, in the tax legislation that I've referred to before, there are very powerful provisions that limit the ability of a person who has a tax liability to avoid the imposition and resist recovery proceedings. The philosophy is pay now and argue later. Uh, for example, there are conclusive evidence provisions in uh, Schedule 1 of the Taxation Administration Act, formerly in the old Act, that assessments have been properly made. That's not conclusive in a tribunal uh, by way of an appeal, but in debt recovery proceedings, it is. And there are also very powerful prima facie evidence certificates that can be issued by the commissioner as an aid in the recovery process. There are two sections of the Taxation Administration Act, 14ZZM and 14ZZR. They're in the actual main body of the Act. They've been there for a while. They're not in Schedule 1, hence the way they frame the sections. There is a, 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 a principle that derives from those sections that even though the tax liability that you're challenging might be subject to a pending appeal or review, it does not affect your liability. And the assessed amount can be recovered as if, as if no appeal or review was pending. So, so faced with that, is it really possible to set aside a statutory demand for an assessed but genuinely disputed tax liability? And we have it now from the High Court that the answer is no. Commission of Taxation and Broad Beach Properties. According to the High Court, once you produce these notices of assessment, they are conclusive proof that the debt is due. And there's a legislative purpose here of, of enabling the commissioner to rely on this conclusive proof situation, and that is protecting the interests of the revenue. So once again, we're seeing those old themes that used to give Crown priority re-emerging in the context of 
something uh, that is in the nature of uh, a, 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 a consolation power that's given for uh, the loss of that priority. The court also said that tax debts have got this special characteristic that distinguishes them from other debts. And I think the court is referring there to this idea of the commissioner uh, and the revenue not being voluntary creditors like other creditors. And um, so they made it very clear that those two provisions that I mentioned of the Taxation Administration Act, they preclude the existence of a genuine dispute or any some other reason. That's another basis for disputing a statutory demand. They preclude it. You just can't rely on it. And this uh, powerful position is uh, uh, demonstrated regularly when uh, the commissioner is the issuer of a statutory demand and an application is made to set it aside. There have been a range of cases where people have been seeking to uh, neutralise the statutory demand and avoid the need to be found to be insolvent. Uh, and, and a recent, a very recent case that came across my desk is that one that I've cited there, PHPR Convenience Proprietor, where, again, an attempt to raise a dispute in respect of a statutory demand was unsuccessful. Now, finally tonight, when talking of these special powers that the Commissioner has, I want to talk briefly about the garnishee powers of the Commissioner. That's the heading to the relevant section or division. The Commissioner may collect amounts from a third party. We now find the relevant provision as section 260-5 in Schedule 1 of the Taxation Administration Act. This uh, power existed formally in the 1936 Act. Uh, in section 218, uh, the provisions are largely the same and the courts have said that all of the case law learning in relation to the operation of the old section 218 can be applied to the new section 260-5. What happens is that any time before a liquidator is appointed, there's a, there's a cutoff there and I'll explain why, the ATO can intercept amounts payable or to become payable by third parties to the taxpayer by just giving them a written notice. And the case law establishes that what this achieves is a statutory charge in relation to those debts that were otherwise payable to the taxpayer. Now, those of you who practice in civil litigation will know that it is possible for any creditor uh, who has obtained a judgment to uh, execute the judgment by issuing a court-ordered garnishee, again, directed to a third-party uh, debtor of the judgment uh, debtor and intercepting the payment by virtue of the service of an order. That is not necessary in the case of the ATO. They have their own self-contained power to issue one of these uh, um, interception notices. Uh, no need for a prior judgment against the taxpayer. The ATO, in a document which I'll refer to in a moment, has listed some of the sorts of debts that it considers are attachable by use of this mechanism. So credit card merchant facilities, uh, bank accounts, amounts payable to the taxpayer by a purchaser of the taxpayer's property, uh, uh, money held in trust for the taxpayer, and also dividends that might be payable to the tax taxpayer. Now, why this power is so significant uh, in insolvencies, as opposed to the ordinary concept of a garnishee by a judgment creditor, uh, is emphasised by a couple of points. Firstly, if the Commissioner uses one of these notices and successfully intercepts an amount payable to uh, the company, the company then goes into liquidation, that uh, interception is not able to be challenged as avoidable preference. Why? because it's not a transaction of the company. If you look at the provisions in the Corporations Act, which set out the, the uh, uh, ingredients for a successful unfair preference action, it needs to be a transaction of the company. And in Commissioner of Taxation and Macquarie Health, the court uh, said that that was simply not what this particular section does. It does not uh, involve a transaction of the company. The company has no say in it. The other thing that uh, the cases have established in Macquarie Health and earlier in a case called Donnelly is that once this power has been invoked, the ATO acquires the status of a secured creditor. And of course, a secured creditor has special rights in relation to insolvencies and bankruptcies and liquidations uh, in being entitled 
um, to uh, 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 proceed with the enforcement of their security without recognising that the uh, usual stay of action that applies to creditors. One uh, very, very interesting outcome of the ability to issue uh, one of these notices to a purchaser from the taxpayer was um, that in doing so, the ATO can in fact frustrate the rights of a registered mortgagee. Now, it doesn't mean that a registered mortgagee of real property is subject to loss of priority with respect to the ATO. What uh, Park's case demonstrated was that the commissioner can serve a notice to intercept the payment that would be coming to the taxpayer in relation to a real property transaction where the taxpayer is the seller, can intercept the obligation of the uh, purchaser to pay the purchase money. And in that way, the money is not able to be dealt with in the usual way where there's a registered mortgagee, namely by paying at settlement the relevant amount owing to the mortgagee uh, in order to obtain a discharge of mortgage. If you don't get a discharge of the mortgage, then you as the purchaser are not going to complete. And that's precisely what happened in Park's case. Um, it's not insurmountable. Uh, one of the things that struck me about Park's case was that uh, it just uh, seemed to me that the appropriate thing that should have been done once the notice was served was for the contract to be uh, basically treated as, uh, or, or at least the contract rescinded, uh, and possibly then the uh, uh, mortgagee coming in uh, uh, over the top. Uh, even whether it was rescinded or not, the mortgagee would be always entitled to exercise their power of sale. And in, in that case, um, uh, it could have been gotten around. But we'll, we'll look at actually what the Commissioner's practice statement now says about this potential to frustrate um, uh, uh, registered mortgagees being paid out when uh, a property is sold. I wanted to just make this additional point here. Uh, there was a quite a bit of law under the old Act uh, prior to the introduction of the Personal Property Securities Act concerning the status of a fixed charge. If a secured creditor had a fixed charge in relation to uh, debts that were otherwise uh, capable of being intercepted, that fixed charge prevailed. Quite a bit of case law had established that, uh, and it prevailed over this statutory charge. Um, I think it's likely to be determined that the position is no different now that we have the PPSA, but we do have a new regime uh, with this idea of no longer having floating charges and fixed charges. We just have uh, uh, securities that attach in relation to various types of property, either circulating property or non-circulating property. And for those of you who have read the Hammersley and Forge litigation, which was ultimately decided in the Supreme Court of Western Australia, there was an analysis of how the PPSA works by the judge at first instance, Justice Tottle, which the Court of Appeal uh, was prepared to accept without deciding, which I think opens up some possibilities, particularly in terms of how a PPSA security might apply with respect to future property that had not been acquired by the grantor at the time one of these notices was given. Watch this space, I think, because there may be an issue uh, that is uh, complicated by the existence of the PPSA. There is guidance for uh, the Commissioner's exercise of this power. I mentioned a little earlier that the Commissioner can't issue these notices after an order is made or a resolution is passed for the winding up of the company. And that made its way to the High Court in Bruton Holdings in 2009. Technically, the power remains available, that is to say the power to issue a statutory garnishee notice while the company is in administration, that is to say before it's proceeded to, for example, liquidation. Um, there would still be an issue about whether having served the notice, it basically can be put into force because we do have those moratorium provisions in relation to uh, secured creditors with uh, certainly with security only over part of the company's property in section 440B. Uh, that requires the liquidators, the administrator's consent or the court's uh, uh, approval. Now, getting to this practice statement, which is an important document, uh, it's a document uh, called PSLA 2011-18. It's what's called a practice statement in connection with the way the commissioner will administer the law. 
effectively guidelines followed in the use of the powers and the enforcement measures. And what we get from that document is that the ATO says that before it issues uh, uh, a Section 265 notice, it will consider the extent of other debts owed by the tax debtor. But it goes on to say, but it's also relevant for the commissioner to consider whether the revenue is placed at risk because of actions of the taxpayer. So weighing these things up, if the taxpayer's been engaged certainly in some uh, less than uh, uh, proper activity, then the commissioner may, uh, despite the existence of other creditors, seek to protect the revenue by exercising these powers. The statement goes on to say that if it's clear that the tax debtor, although it's not in an insolvency administration, is about to go into an administration and the notice hasn't been issued, the ATO will take into account, not necessarily will always agree to not do something, but will take into account the impact on uh, unrelated arm's length creditors. So Commissioner preserving this power, but saying that just as a matter of discretion, this will be taken into account. Now, if the company goes into liquidation, administration or receivership, and I assume uh, it also means restructuring, and that happens after the commissioner has already served the notice, but before it's been fully effected, the ATO says in this practice statement, it will not ordinarily withdraw the notice. And importantly, for the point about the Park case, the commissioner has now quite reasonably said that if the commissioner is going to potentially exercise the power to attach to settlement money that's needed to discharge a registered mortgage to enable the sale to proceed, the ATO may, not must, may require that the notice only apply to the money that's actually going to flow to the tax debtor as part of the settlement after the mortgage is discharged, which uh, I think would be uh, hopefully the, the situation uh, in, in, in most uh, conveyancing uh, situations. That is basically all I have. I could go on at much greater length, but I did want to give the opportunity to Michael to move on to his presentation tonight about what the Parliamentary Joint Committee uh, has heard about the Commissioner. Thanks very much, Lindsay. Um, can I... Yes, I'll stop sharing and... Uh, you stop sharing and I'll do my bit. Share screen. Slide show. From beginning, over to your left. Uh, Keep going left, down, down. There we down. are. Ta, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lindsay, and um, thank you for your attention. Um, what I wanted to do by way of commentary on Lindsay's paper is um, talk a little bit about what the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services said um, about the role of the ATO and, um, and, and make a couple of comments about, about that and potentially feedback into some of the things that Lindsay mentioned. Um, the... First point, there we are. So the, why, why is it that the parliamentary inquiry looked at the role of the ATO? Well, it was actually directed to do it. Um, Michael, just sorry, interrupt you, maybe. Interrupt. Yeah. sorry Michael, think... it hasn't actually flipped over the slide. So oh. if you click from current slide there on the uh, top left. Top left. On the, uh, on the left menu there where you can see copies of your slides, directly above that, you'll see a little button that says from current slide. Ah, oh. oh, there we go. That, Great. There we go. Ah, oh, that's good. Um, so why is it that was the commissioner... Um, uh, called called and uh, considered by the committee. Well, the committee was specifically asked to look at the role of the commissioner in the context of asking um, or the, the committee to consider the role of government agencies in the corporate insolvency system and including the ATO's role in enforcement approaches to corporate insolvency 
and I won't deal with this, but it also dealt with relevant changes to its approach over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for those of you who are interested, there is actually quite a good amount of data in that which shows the impact and tracks what most practitioners have understood has occurred through the pandemic. Um, the terms of reference also called out other um, government organisations, particularly ASIC, the Asset List Administration Fund and the Small Business Ombudsman. Um, one of the, except one of the, um, an omission I think from the list which was cured during the course of the inquiry was, was FEG. Um, FEG did come in for quite a deal of mention and consideration is actually mentioned in the report as well. The final point I wanted to make about that in terms of the terms of reference is this was a committee of reference which didn't dealt with corporate insolvency um, reform. Um, it didn't deal with individuals. And I think that's relevant because um, obviously many taxpayers are individuals um, and the approach that one might take to individuals might be a little bit different to corporations. That I think is going to be relevant and a point to watch as things develop with this inquiry, because one of the clear themes was a desire to see a greater degree of um, uh, uh, uniformity between corporate and um, individual uh, financial distress. And obviously the commissioner will have a considerable role to play in relation to that. What were some of the findings um, and key commentaries that were made in the course of the um, inquiry? Well, a statement of probably the obvious. Um, insolvency processes will often involve the ATO as most companies have some kind of tax liability. But that's a sort of a long-handed or short-handed way of saying the commissioner is often quoted as saying that it's the largest unsecured creditor in the country. Um, and it participates in many, many, and probably the majority, vast majority of insolvencies that occur in the country. So they've got uh, unique insights into what actually happens. The commissioner takes the position that until a company enters into a formal insolvency process, its role is to administer the tax and superannuation systems to recover debts. Now that's important because you looked at that slide that Lindsay mentioned about the garnishee notices, because it says, well, really until the company goes into insolvency, my role is to try and get the money in to protect the revenue. It's only after the company enters into an insolvency process that we look at our position as a creditor. Now, as I say, in a technical sense, participating in an in insolvency process. The other point that was made was that the DPN system that Lindsay highlighted can bring to a head the insolvency of struggling companies, property directors to appoint an external administrator. We see that, um, again, practitioners will know that that's a, a, a real um, clear timeline provided to directors to do something about their companies. Um, so it does actually prompt uh, companies to go into external administration. The other um, part of the analysis which says that the ATO is a sort of initiator of insolvency processes is that um, it obviously, as Lindsay points out, issues statutory demands. Interestingly, though, its submission was that it's a relatively minor contributor to liquidations overall in that regard, um, although that contention was actually con challenged by um, a, a, a RETA. Um, so what was some of the couple, of, there was a couple of themes that I just wanted to call out that are worthwhile just considering. Um, the first one is a desire, I think, by many practitioners that the ATO be more pro proactive. Now, obviously, the commissioner says, well, I'm my role is to try and correct the revenue, collect the revenue. It's not to try and initiate insolvency processes for participants um, in the Australian economy. But um, the desire that the ATO be more proactive, because this will put pressure on directors to do something when it's human nature to do nothing. Um, and I've cited there a KPMG submission, which is that the commissioner could play a part in encouraging companies to face their problems sooner, which would allow insolvency practitioners more latitude to rescue the company. And I think that's a point well made, and it feeds into another point, which is that, um, again, and this feeds a little bit in some of those themes that Lindsay was talking about in the context of things that the commissioner knows, because um, it's probably one of the best informed creditors as well about the financial position of a company, because if the company is actually filing returns and providing business activity statements and all the rest of it, 
it's probably in a very privileged position, as it were, to and have insights into the company's actual financial position. Now, that's the tension because they might say, well, I think they're doing okay enough to enable them to pay their tax, which is really what I'm on about. But on the other hand, as has been pointed out by the KPMG folk, if they could, in fact, put some pressure on the directors earlier, they might put the company into administration at an earlier stage. And the notion is that there'd be more um, latitude to rescue because there's going to be more assets there. The company might be in such a dire strait, dire straits that it, liquidation is simply inevitable. So I think that that's a that's a, a, an interesting tension, I think, that will develop as these recommendations flow through. Um, uh, Jason, um, Professor Harris um, had some interesting feedback um, that indicated a confusion about the role of the commissioner. Is it a commercial creditor or is it a policeman? So again, what, what is the role of the commissioner? Is it up until an insolvency process invokes, it's to collect the revenue after that, well, what is it meant to do? Now, I've referred to a case um, there, which was a decision of the full court of the federal court this was one of the pieces of litigation that flowed from an application by the commissioner for an inquiry into the conduct of a liquidator. Um, and one of the points that was taken um, in opposition to the commissioner's position was that there was an objection taken to evidence that it had secured under compulsory power. And there was a question about whether or not this was a legitimate use of that information for the purposes of conducting an inquiry. The submission that was made against the commissioner was that really because you're looking for a banning order against this liquidator, um, you are, as it were, acting as a regulator. This has got nothing to do with actually collecting tax tax or revenue or whatever. Now, that submission was ultimately rejected and because, and because as part of the remedy sought by the commissioner in, in seeking the inquiry was compensation. And compensation was the, the unpaid tax that it was said by the commissioner to have flowed from the phoenixing activity that was the subject of the um, it was set, thought to be the subject sought to be the subject of the inquiry. So the court said that that was sufficient to say that this was the use of material in the course of litigation for the purposes in connection with the administration of a taxation law. But again, this tension as to what should the commissioner's role be was exposed um, in that case. Um, one of the key recommendations that came out of it was that the ATO consult, act on, and publish model creditor guidelines. Now, Lindsay referred in his paper to some of the, um, the, the, uh, the guidelines that are published by the commissioner about their enforcement activities. And I'm assuming that it would have something um, along the lines of that. It, it would be some, in something along the lines of that, that this sort of role would be adopted. Um, the, the submission was largely proposed by Rita, and it was to build on a the commissioner's role as a model litigant. So whenever the, the Commonwealth litigates, it's subject to what are called model litigant guidelines under the legal services directions of 2017, in essence, to act honestly and fairly, fairly in handling claims and litigation. And the thought was that we could have something akin to that that said that the commissioner has got to be held almost to a higher standard than other creditors uh, when dealing with um, uh, uh, insolvent companies and that have passed into external administration. So they wanted to see um, uh, effectively the commissioner take an active role um, in the conduct of liquidations, et cetera. And I put up on the slide some of the things that um, uh, they, it was thought that this model litigation model guideline would actually support, um, that the commissioner would be called upon not to abstain on creditor votes, actually turn up and attend meetings, um, support resolutions to approve remuneration for work properly performed. Obviously, sometimes the commission is the only creditor or, or one of the only few creditors in the administration. The practitioner wants to get their fees approved, wanting, wanting to try and get their support on that, not take advantages of practitioners who are unfunded. Um, not seek to prioritise their commission position above those of unsecured creditors. And again, there's a tension there with some of the points that Lindsay was making before. Responding to requests for information and um, alongside the liquidator, report potential breaches of the law to regulators. So that seems 
um, a, a very public-minded approach that um, Rita would have the Commissioner undertake in the course of its interactions with insolvency practitioners and in liquidations. Um, the question that came up in my mind are two things before I, I close out, is that when you look at um, that uh, laundry list that are looked for, you've got to look at the resources of the Commissioner uh, balanced against the benefits of the system overall. Yes, it would be good if we had a, a proactive, you know, uniform creditor in the system who was actively voting and turning up and all the rest of it. Firstly, not that they don't, but obviously there are many, many companies going into liquidations. There are many, many creditors meetings. Um, commissioner has to get worded up, participate. Um, they do it by telephone. There's resources that are required to be devoted to these exercises. And from the commissioner's perspective, if their role is to the administer the tax laws to collect revenue, is that a cost-effective answer? Um, the second point I wanted to make in relation to that recommendation is um, the model litigant guideline is probably um, a good analog for what has been proposed. But I put up there in the slide um, a very important rider that applies, um, and anybody who has litigated with the, with the Commonwealth knows um, that um, sometimes this can be in the, very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, the model litigant guidelines does not prevent the Commonwealth and Commonwealth agencies from acting firmly and properly to protect their interests. Uh, it does not preclude all legitimate steps being taken to pursue claims and testing or defending claims against them. And it doesn't preclude pursuing litigation in order to, fight, to clarify a significant point of law, even if the other party wishes to settle the dispute. In other words, they can run a test case if, if that's what they want to do. Um, when you sort of look at that as, as, as something that might be part of this model creditor guideline and think what would be said, you, you would understand that there will have to be some give and take in that process um, uh, to, to, to get the, you know, to, to make it, give it proper sense. Because at the end of the day, as I say, the commissioner's role is to collect the revenue um, so that, you know, teachers and police um, officers can be paid um, each week. So that's all I wanted to say in relation to that. There's some very good reading in the report, um, which I'd recommend to anybody. There's some great understanding, you know, gen general statements about how insolvency laws work, um, but they're, they're the particular highlights. And so far as I can see is affect the commissioner. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, now I'm just mindful of the time. Lindsay and Michael, are you okay if we just spend maybe another two or three minutes with a, a couple of questions? Absolutely. Uh, so first things first, uh, Peter has asked, is it the commissioner's practice to press a statutory demand where there is a bona fide appeal? Well, I, I must say I haven't uh, myself personally been involved uh, in uh, that circumstance, but um, uh, there's no reference to it. Uh, in connection with the policy statement about uh, enforcement. Uh, I would expect that the Commissioner would take the same view about it. Uh, certainly, if you've got a stay uh, in relation to the liability, uh, then that's, that's not going to be something that uh, can be pursued. Um, but where it's a situation that there is a genuine dispute that's bona fide being subject to an appeal, uh, I suspect that the commissioner will uh, fall back on the power to simply say, well, my rights to recover are here now and you can argue later. The one thing that has been uh, uh, sometimes overlooked is that despite these issues going towards statutory demands and despite the fact that if you're not a, a given the opportunity to raise a bona fide dispute and you were deemed to be insolvent, it's not the end of the matter because when the time comes for the court to actually decide whether it's going to wind the company up or not, the court has a discretion. And if there was, I would suggest that if there was by that time uh, an advance bona fide appeal on foot, uh, I think at the very minimum you would be able to persuade the court to adjourn the hearing of the winding up application until that was known. Uh, bear in mind, this: the statutory demands are preliminary to that inquiry. Statutory demand is simply setting up the grounds to get the court's jurisdiction invoked. Uh, 
whether the court will ultimately exercise the jurisdiction to make a winding up order uh, remains its discretion. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, so we have a question from Shruti who asks, uh, what happens if the client has claimed GST refunds and the commissioner has issued an amendment to reclaim the refund? Would this be a lockdown penalty notice or a standard penalty notice, given that the reporting was done but done incorrectly? Well, I guess the answer to that will be found on what is the reporting obligation and whether it gives rise to a, uh, a conclusive situation in favour of the commissioner if you have uh, incorrectly reported, then you would certainly be in a situation where you'll be facing the problem of uh, being treated as not having properly reported at all. Um, for example, if you just simply sent in a BAS statement and didn't complete any of the details, uh, you're not really reporting anything. Now, that's a difficult issue, I must say. I don't know how the Commissioner goes about amending these uh, amounts when there is a reclaim of the GST, that's quite a specialist uh, uh, question and I wouldn't be able to do that one, one without uh, taking it on notice. But I could uh, uh, suggest that there is a very a good document that's published on the Taxation Office Officer's website uh, in relation to the Director's Penalty Regime. It gives uh, examples of circumstances in which the commissioner will treat uh, a situation as a lockdown situation or not a lockdown situation. So uh, that might be one place you could go to uh, initially to uh, get some guidance on that. Thanks very much. Um, now, we also have a, a comment from Scott, uh, who uh, makes a comment about uh, DPNs in relation to unpaid superannuation. Uh, and he says the uh, director penalty liability locks down if the company does not lodge an SGC statement by the due date for payment of the Quite SGC right. liability. Um, so, so just know right. that. I think, I think I, I, I did that a little too quickly. Um, the unremitted amounts, the lockdown situation is uh, three months. Uh, uh, you've got to report SGC is treated differently. Uh, uh, and you're quite right, Scott. Uh, the, the lockdown uh, takes effect by reference to the due date, not any grace period that follows after that. And then lastly, just a, a question from Peter. Are you both happy to distribute your slides to the attendees? Absolutely, yep. Fantastic. So th this session has been uh, recorded. Uh, I know there's a couple of other questions, but I'm just mindful of everyone's time. So we might draw it to a close there. Uh, so thanks everyone for giving up your time tonight. That's been a, a fascinating discussion into this very complicated uh, legislative framework for tax recovery. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we've all learned something new from that discussion. And, and based on what Michael's saying, uh, perhaps there might be some further change coming uh, in the future if the ATO responds positively to the PJC report. Uh, and thanks, of course, to our presenters tonight, uh, Lindsay and Michael. Thanks so much for giving up your time uh, and sharing your thoughts with us. So this, the copy of the recording will be sent to all of the uh, um, recorded uh, attendees. Uh, so everyone who signed up will get a copy of the recording and we'll also post it up to the Sydney Law School uh, YouTube page. When we email out the link to the recording, we'll also include the slides from the presenters. So thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Thank guys. you.